Investors Chronicle. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm afraid today is a very sad day for all of us connected with the IC, except possibly for our guest. We've got Chris Dillow back on the podcast for one last time on his very last day at the IC, and I think it's his last day of gainful employment. Chris has been writing on markets and economics at the IC since September 1995, almost 27 years. So today we're going to take the opportunity to reflect on some of the most important things he's learned. Chris, thank you for joining me. How are you feeling on on Liberation Day? Very excited, you know, and a bit nervous. So how how are you going to spend your time as of the rest of the week and next week? I'll do a lot more exercise. I'll go to the gym. Um, go for walks, you know, and um, I'm going to learn Italian, play lots of guitar, uh, try and look after my garden. Oh, there's going to be, I'm going to read a lot more as well. There's going to be tons to do. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I feel, feel quite envious. So before this podcast, I asked you to send through some pointers on, on key things you wanted to discuss. Um, and I think one which is particularly timely from... Well, my experience at the IC over, over the last two and a half years, your first point was that returns are not normally distributed and that extremes are more likely. Uh, can you talk us through how, what the significance of this is and, and how it leads to investment mistakes or how you should think about it in the context of investing? I can tell you precisely when I learned this lesson. It was October the 19th, 1987 which was just a few da- a few weeks after I started work for an old stockbroker. Um, the market crashed on Black Monday. Um, it fell 11% on the Monday, another 10% on the, on the Tuesday. And those were moves of 10, 11 standard deviations, which if returns are normally distributed as a bell curve, is the sort of thing that should pretty much never happen. You know, so that day I learned that markets were riskier than, than, than people think. And they're risky, not just in the sense that there is ordinary volatility, but there is a greater chance of an extreme loss than you would expect from a normal distribution. And if you didn't learn that in 1987, you'd have learned it again in 2007 during the financial crash. And Goldman Sachs' David Vinia famously said then that we were seeing 25 standard deviation events several days in a row. Now, you do not see 25 standard deviation events in, in, in nature if things are normally distributed. What he meant was that extreme returns were far more likely than, than a normal distribution would suggest. And also that he had or his company or his colleagues had misestimated what the standard deviation was because they were looking at a biased sample of past returns which oversampled stability and undersampled volatility. So do you think this is something that people understand properly? Like when um, people in the industry are forecasting returns, is that usually based on the assumption of a normal distribution? Well, it's a single point forecast for returns can be based on any distribution or none. Now, what matters is the distribution of risks. And my my point is simply that the risk of a large fall is is perhaps greater than, 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 than people think and greater than you would infer if you just assume that past returns uh, are, are normally distributed. Um, From the point of view of day-to-day moves, um, most of the time, by definition, this isn't an operational consideration because most of the time we don't see extremes by by definition. But but very occasionally uh, we do. And that's, that's that's when things get scary. And it could be that this actually matters because it explains why equities do so well over the long run in that long run returns seem to be better than you would expect for ordinary returns to take in on risk. What it could be the case is that the reason why equities have to offer 
decent returns over the long run is to compensate investors for the tiny chance of a catastrophe. Now, that tiny chance isn't just every piece of Black Monday, you know, but it could also be the chance of a complete wipeout. Because historically, an awful lot of the stock markets that have existed subsequently closed. You know, in, in 1917, for example, Russian equities looked like a decent investment. They didn't look so good in 1918. Similarly, they look like a decent investment in 2021, but not so much in 2022. So history repeats itself. Mm. It also makes me think that timing is actually really important, even though people are always saying that you can't time the market. And They're right in that you can't time the market in the sense that you can predict those few days in history when we do see extreme returns. You can't predict those. But you can predict longer term returns simply by looking at the dividend yield, or at least so history tells us. Now, there's no reason to suppose that um, history is a, a, an infallible guide to the future. But if, if the future does resemble the past, then you can use the dividend yield to get an idea of what returns will be over three or five years. Um, and another one of your lessons was that you can't be a long term buy and hold stock picker because companies don't last very long. This sort of flies in the face with of Terry Smith's philosophy, or he's very proud of the fact that the average foundation year of his companies is from the 1920s. And so they're almost 100 years old. What are your thoughts on on that? In a sense... He's got a point because the probability of a company dying does fall away sharply uh, as the company ages. I mean, a company that's newly formed has quite a high uh, chance of collapsing. A company that's 100 years old has much, much less chance. But then again, if, if you look back at what companies were in the FTSE 100 um, when, when, I, when I started work in 1987, now, things like House of Fraser, British and Commonwealth, General Electric. Now, now those have, have, have long since disappeared. And the message there is that an awful lot of what we think of as blue chip companies are, in fact, no such thing. You know? And that competition, bad management, and in some cases, outright fraud, um, can, can, can bring e even well-established companies crashing down or send them into long-term decline. Now, if maybe if you have the skills of Terry Smith, you can uh, pick a, a, a dozen stocks and hold them for 20, 30 years. But I wouldn't bet on you having Terry Smith's skills, and I don't think you should either. I agree with that. I, when I was um, researching, it was interesting to see that in 2020, the average lifespan of a company in the S&P 500 was 21 years compared with 32 years in the 1960s. So that does seem to be a clear trend of the lifespan of companies getting shorter. I think it's a tricky one because there's, there's two different things going on in the US. On the one hand, there does seem to be a long-term trend decline in the rate of profit suggesting that the average company is less profitable now than in the, in the 60s, which, of course, means a heightened risk for, for, for the tail of the distribution of going bust. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is an increase in monopoly power in that a handful of companies like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, now account for a large chunk of the capitalization of, of the S&P 500, a larger chunk than was, ex, than was accounted for by the largest handful of companies in, in the 60s and, and 70s, for example. So, so, so you've got those two different trends. One, a lot of firms are struggling now more so than uh, 50 years ago. On the other hand, though, a handful of, of superstar companies uh, seem to have entrenched monopoly power. Winner takes it all. But we're not seeing that in the UK so much, are we? No, we're not. No. Um, 
the US is exceptional here in that over the last, what, 20, 30 years, there's been an increase in the share of profits in GDP at the expense of wages, and which is largely accounted for by a few very successful companies. In most of the rest of the developed world, we're not see, we've not seen that increase in the profit share, you know. And in the UK and to a lesser extent, I think Eurozone, we, we've we've not seen the increased concentration uh, in the market either. I mean, sure, Shell and AstraZeneca and such like are a large chunk of the index, but but that that's been the case case for some time. Whereas in the US, it seems to be a relatively newer phenomenon for uh, for capitalization to be more concentrated. Do you think that's a, a real problem in the US? And do you th- see any way that it, it could start a reversal? Perhaps perhaps inflation could cause a cause a change and push up wages and well. It's not obvious that that's happening at the moment. I mean, in the US, as in the UK, average real wages seem to be coming down. And you would think, if anything, that inflation would be a factor causing increased concentration, because in inflationary times, what you really, really want is, is pricing power. And pricing power is very often a function of size. So in a sense, it's rather paradoxical that we're seeing a decline in the valuations of very large companies at the same time as we're we're seeing in inflation. You know, I I suspect those those are two two different trends. Valuation deflation is caused by factors other than um, higher inflation. I guess valuations got unusually high. What impact do you think decoupling from the West and China will have on the US and UK economies, if you think it's happening at all? I'm not, I'm not sure, sure, sure it is happening. Um, one great difficulty we, we've had um, since, since COVID is that there is talk of deglobalisation and, and talk of companies reducing their, their, their supply chains, doing a bit more onshoring. And, but it's, it's very difficult to see that that's, is a very substantial development at the, at the moment. You know, it's something that might, might well happen in the future. But, but for, for now, um, deglobalisation is, is only, only quite a slight development. I noticed that the last time we spoke, the podcast was published on the 23rd of February, so just before Russia invaded Ukraine and we were talking about inflation and you said that you thought it would start to come down in April uh, in in the spring what's your view on the outlook for inflation now in a sense what's changed is that gas prices after I said that shot up which is likely to cause another increase um, in in prices when the energy cap gets reviewed in in October so in that sense, the view that inflation would come down after April um, ha- has been overtaken by events. But that said, um, gas future prices at the moment seem to be significantly lower than they were then. So depending on what happens to the energy price cap, you know, it is still quite possible that gas prices will come down, hopefully very sharply for the consumer in 2023. And that would be disinflationary. But also, high energy prices themselves are disinflationary for for the rest of the economy. And if we're spending all our money on gas bills, we've got nothing left to spend anywhere else. And that means that if you're doing anything other than producing gas, you just aren't going to have the pricing power. Now, you'll you'll want to raise prices because companies have to pay electricity bills just as much as individuals. But whether you actually can um, when your customers aren't there is another matter. Yeah, that's true. Do do you worry about food prices as well? Yes. We're not seeing very much food price inflation at the moment. Um, uh, That that could be further down the pipeline. It depends a lot on what happens to 
to harvests in 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 the Ukraine and what happens to uh, wheat, wheat prices and the sunflower or, or oil prices prices there. Um, I suspect the food price inflation is going to be a far nastier problem for, for poorer countries um, than, than, than for richer ones. Um, not just because, by definition, they're poor, but also because they've got fewer ways of substituting um, from some foods to others. What What are your thoughts on how the Bank of England have handled everything? There's quite a lot in the press. MPs have been quite critical, but in a way, they're in a they're in a bit of a bind. A lot of these things that external forces. If you were the governor, <laughs> would you have acted in a similar way? In a sense, yes. I mean, there, there are two defences of the Bank of England here. One is that they could not have foreseen Russia invading Ukraine. Uh, and also, it's not the job of the Bank of England to suppress inflation in the face of external shocks, such as oil prices shooting up or gas prices shooting up. Um, the Bank of England, within its remit, is asked to look through sort of those sort of temporary shocks. Another defence of the bank is that to the extent that what we're seeing is a supply shock, the way to get inflation down is to reduce aggregate demand to match the lower level of, of, of supply. The, the logic um, behind higher interest rates is that it will depress aggregate demand and that will reduce inflation in those parts of the economy that don't produce oil and gas. You know, um, so so in that sense, um, we, we we can defend the bank. Where I think um, the bank bank's acts and words have been indefensible have been in Andrew Bailey calling for wage restraint. Now it is quite simply not the job of the Bank of England to do that. And I don't think anybody is going to listen to it uh, because, you know, if, if I were still in work, I wouldn't accept uh, a real wage cut on his say so. You know, and I wouldn't expect any other worker to either. Yeah, with his hundreds of thousands of pounds pay package. It's... Quite. It, it, what it does is, is it brings the Bank of England in, into disrepute and it brings the Bank of England in, into the political arena. And that's that's dangerous for the bank's own reputation. Perhaps a development from that. Your your big lesson was that experts know less than you think. Um, so fund managers can't pick stocks. Economists can't predict recessions. Analysts cannot foresee corporate growth. Can you talk us through your thinking on this? Maybe you should start from the sort of economics I learned in the 80s, uh, which is pretty mainstream. And we were told that Everybody had rational expectations about, about the, 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 the future. And we were told that in stock markets that markets were efficient, that all information was in the price because the, the people in aggregates who, who set prices um, were, uh, had some, some degree of great foresight. Um, and what I've learned since leaving the university, moving into the real world, is that this is just plain wrong. I mean, for example, the, 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 my statement that economists can't predict recessions. There's a guy called Prakash Langani at the IMF who has actually gone through the numbers. And he's shown that around the world, the recessions of the early 90s and 2008, 2009 were largely unpredicted until, the, until they were pretty much on top of us. If you want to predict a recession, you simply look at the shape of the yield curve in either the UK or US. You do not listen to, to economists. As for fund managers not being able to pick stocks, in a sense, we have known this for as long as anybody has been looking at the data. And the American economist Michael Jensen first pointed it out back in the, back in the mid 60s, based on post-war studies of actively managed funds, but we've had just evidence after evidence after evidence since then um, that, that they can't do it. What tends to happen is that if small stocks outperform the market, that is if most stocks outperform, most fund managers will outperform. But if big stocks outperform the market, as we've seen so far this year in the UK with, with Shell going up so much and the rest of the market coming down, then most fund managers underperform. 
Now that is entirely consistent with most fund managers just picking stocks at random. You know, if you pick stocks at random and most stocks outperform the market, you'll outperform the market. If you pick them at random and and Shell drags the index up, you'll underperform. No, that definitely makes sense. I don't want to pit you against one of your colleagues, but I was looking at Simon Thompson's Bargains Shares portfolio, and it's done really well. As a one-year average return over 23 years of 21.9%, this was in February when he ran it, compared with 4.5% for the FTSE All Share. And I know that it's a bit different because he's not actually buying them and there are inefficiencies there. But, you know, is that is that is he just really lucky? He might be lucky. He 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 or oh, what I'm supposed to say, he might he he might be very clever. But what we do know is that most fund managers, most active fund managers do not over time have anything like the success that that, that he's had. Do you think maybe private investors have an advantage over fund managers? They don't have to report to shareholders, they don't have to move large sums of money. I guess there are advantages that they have more access to information, though. It's touch and go, really. And um, there's advantages on both sides. What um, retail investors have an advantage over is, is, is liquidity, in that they can get rid of positions or get into positions quite quickly. Whereas if you're managing a two, three billion fund, you know, it's, it's far, far harder. You know? And that allows retail investors, should they want, to be momentum investors to a greater extent than than professional fund managers can, for example. You said earlier that when you started your career in the 1980s, you, you were taught that everyone's a rational actor. And then, you know, now people focus a lot on cognitive biases led by the work of Daniel Kahneman. How important do you think cognitive biases are to people's understanding of investing and how can you adjust for these? In a sense, the, the jury is very much out on how far cognitive biases are a systematic in, uh, effect of, uh, uh, of share prices. So simply because if you see a share that looks underpriced, you can very easily attribute it to some sort of cognitive biases among investors, or you can attribute it to that that share having unusual levels of risk. It is very hard to adjudicate between the two. The way I prefer to think of cognitive biases is more as a warning for for the individual. You know, what, what we're saying is, here's a particular mistake that other people have been seen to make in various contexts. Just try not to make it yourself. You know, so I I, I regard the, the cognitive biases program as being not so much a way of explaining the world, though though maybe it can do that, but as a way of giving people advice on what mistakes not to make. You know, and avoiding mistakes is, I think, one of the key things investors can do. You know, it's not about picking the best stocks or being clever. It's about avoiding the well-known pitfalls. You know, as, as Warren Buffett said, first of all, investors don't lose money. Do you think that just thinking about the fact you're saying returns aren't normally distributed and these extreme events happen and in the past couple of years we've had the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, which would have been very difficult to forecast. Do you think that the reliance the industry has on probabilistic forecasting is a bit of a waste of time or or even damaging it depends i'm afraid that's very very dull one of the things that really does wind me up is when uh, people attach distinct probabilities to particular scenarios like when they say there's a 23 percent chance of recession and um, that that sort of thing can be very silly but if you're just thinking about what level the FTSE 100 will be this time next year. Now, I think it is reasonable to put some kind of probabilities around that based on some estimation of, of, of past volatilities and uncertainties. 
Now, that, that sort of thing is perfectly reasonable. And the moment you do it, um, you, 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 you realise just how little you know, because even quite reasonable um, probabilities um, give, give you a very wide range indeed. Humans just crave certainty and answers. I kind of asked that because I read, I don't know if you read John Kay and Mervyn King's book, Radical Uncertainty. And I thought it was very interesting reading about the fact that Northern Rock had been labelled the best capitalised bank under the Basel, Basel, Basel regulations in 2007. And then the following year it collapsed, having been felled by an off-model event. Well, what was wrong with Northern Rock wasn't so much its capitalisation, and it wasn't even its loan book. It, it, you know, its, its loans were pretty, pretty decent. What failed it was its reliance upon wholesale funding. You know, and the point, the point being that the the risks um, that can then bring companies down are, are often unforeseeable. You know, and that that's why I prefer I, I prefer to think of probabilities as, as as being oh, things that apply over over prices rather than probabilities of particular events, and because we 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 can't see what events are coming, we we couldn't see the war um, between Russia and Ukraine, you know, until a few weeks before it began. But what what you can do is um, look at the past volatility of, of, of oil prices, say, and use that to gain an idea of what the future range of possible oil prices is. And the oil price now is pretty much within the sort of range that you would have attached to it six months ago. You generally advocate that people invest in passive over active. In terms of asset allocation, would you advise people to be a bit tactical about that, depending on the state of the economy and markets? Or or would you say world index tracker and and be done with it i think there is a case for a bit of tactical asset allocation because we know that there are some things that can predict returns one is the the yield curve you know if the yield curve is inverted that's a predictor of poor equity returns another is the dividend yield itself a low low dividend yield predicts low returns, and also I am not convinced that seasonal investing, you know, buy on Halloween, sell on May Day, has has, has completely disappeared. You know, so so you can finesse returns, you know, by using those those lead indicators. What I think you can't do is to use your personal judgment um, about valuations, about where the economy is heading. I wouldn't base asset allocation on, on, on judgments. Yeah. And I'd encourage everyone to read your cover feature in the IC this week, um, which is all about how much we don't know. <laughs> Just to close the interview off, I've got a few. I've been asking around some of some of our colleagues for some for some anecdotes and I hear you're a big fan of country music and specifically of Hank Williams Jumbo line a crawfish pine a feely gumbo I wondered what you think country music can tell us about the state of the US economy to, to bring it back to topic well you know that is actually a far more intelligent question than, than you might think because uh, music is a sociological document. Um, for example, Bruce Springsteen's album Born in the USA, released in 1985, told us about deindustrialization and about the threats to American identity coming from the, um, the sense of American decline. He was onto it a lot, lot earlier than politicians and your hillbilly elegy uh, guff. You know, so in that sense, music tells us something. Similarly, the popularity of drill music um, in inner cities tells us about the, the violence and, and dangers that the urban youth uh, are, 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 con are confronted with. So music does tell us something. And the thing about country music 
in America is that on the one hand, it's incredibly diverse. But on the other hand, American radio in particular plays only a fraction of what there is out there. You know, it doesn't it doesn't play your Sturgill Simpson very much or your Billy Strings. And it, it plays very, very few women artists. What it tends to be dominated by is men in hats singing uh, about beer and pickup trucks and such like. And what that tells us is partly that there are contrasting trends in America between, on the one hand, the, the diversity of, of ideas and uh, identities, but on the other hand, the urge to suppress that diversity and have us monopolised by a particular identity. But on the other hand, this sort of cliched, hackneyed country music um, does hint that there is an assertion of traditional mascul masculinity in the face of threats to that masculinity, coming, for example, from... Um, from economic decline and in particular the fact that there's much less role for you know semi-skilled and unskilled male workers than the, there was 40 50 years ago well that's because they've got all the women flooding the workforce now not not Isn't not it? just women in the, in the workforce but decline of decline of heavy industry yeah you know, you know I mean, post war america was the best place in the history of the world to be if you were an unskilled man. You could get yourself a decent job, you know, security, nice house, you know, and that's something that was not possible in pretty much anywhere in the world before then, and it's not possible anymore for a lot of the world. And a lot of America is, is struggling to come to terms with that, you know. Um, the economy shapes and influences ide identity, you know. So, so the, the the crisis of identity is a product of long term economic developments. But we'll move on. I hear you're a big Arsenal fan, so commiserations on the result against Newcastle. But I don't know anything about football, so it's best we don't <laughs> get sucked into a discussion on that. <laughs> But I hear you were particularly keen on Tony Adams, who was captain in the 1990s. I believe that he's a bit of a reformed character and closet intellectual, having struggled with drink and even spending a brief spell in prison for drink driving. But to bring it back, do you think he would be a monetarist or a Keynesian? This is a tricky one because Tony Adams was a great stickler for rules, you know, especially the offside rule, which suggests that he'd be keen on strict monetary targeting you know, of monetarism. But also, he was a guy who moved with the times. He reinvented himself from being the sort of old school central defender who'd get drunk every night to being the sober, very fit, ball-playing central defender um, that, 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 that we see these days. So that shows he's got an, an ability to adapt to new times and to, to, to new conditions, which makes me suspect that... You know, he would be like the best economist today, not so much worried about in inflation and managing the economic cycle, but worried about the causes of, of low long term growth. Um, he'd be thinking about the causes of secular stagnation, low labour productivity and the solutions to it. What solutions might he be able to come up with? This is oh, what you're oh, going to spend your time thinking about in retirement, surely? <laughs> yes. Basically, what what we need is... Anything that gets capital spending going, better research and development. There's lots of causes, productivity stagnation, and therefore lots of possible remedies. You know, it's not a case of there being a magic bullet. Do you think that needs to be steered by the government, or do you think it's better for the market to do it on its own? Well, we're not getting any steer from the government. I mean, one curiosity of the government is that it is totally innocent of economics. Um, you know, I'm, it's not just Brexit that's an example of that. And the levelling up agenda is all wind. You know, there, there seems to be no recognition that British capitalism needs defending 
and uh, needs a policy response to to re-legitimate it. You know, I, I'm not surprised to see capitalism in decline. What I am surprised by is that nobody seems to care. Well, m- maybe in some parts of government, but I, I think I think lots of people care, don't they? Yes, yes, outside of government, they do. But one of the weird things to have happened over my adult lifetime is the decline in economics has been the focus of party politics because from the 60s 70s 80s you know the question was always how do we improve economic growth how do we improve long-run economic performance now Thatcher and Gordon Brown uh, uh, and, and, and all others had had very different answers to that but they at least they asked the question now, and that's something we, we, we're not seeing now we, we've, we've descended into into culture wars. I also hear that you are left-handed and have a bit of a thing about your left-handedness, which is a particular area interest to, of interest to me because I'm also left-handed. A- apparently, you claim it cost you a first at university. What's what's the story here? I don't know whether this is true of all left-handed. It's true of me. You, you can't write very fast, and you can't write very clearly. You know, and that's a drawback in exams where you have to write a lot, you know. But it's it's this that caused me to become an economist because as an economist, all you can do is, if you just write down a few equations, a few diagrams, you know, the job's easy of sitting an exam, you know. But if you are trying to sit an exam in philosophy and politics where you need to put down a lot of information and nuanced ideas, then the handwriting is a drawback pushing the pen rather than pulling it. I know, but maybe perhaps it's a good thing. Slow you down, calibrate your thoughts. I doubt, I doubt it's necessarily the longest essays that, <laughs> that get the highest marks in the exams. Chris, we are out of time, but thank you so much. Will you will you be writing your blog more? Stumbling and mumbling, everybody can find it if they want to continue to read your thoughts. I might well be, yes. It depends on the weather. Well, um, let's all hope for lots of rain in Rutland. (laughs) It's what we're going to (laughs) get. It's been a pleasure, Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Joe. Me gotta go. Me oh my oh. Me gotta go. Pull the piro down the bio. My Yvonne, the sweetest one, me oh my oh Son of a gun, we'll have big fun on the bio <laughs>